what up and welcome back to another Malazan book of the fall in video. This time we're talking about Dead House Gates chapter two. It's actually one of the most like consequential setup chapters of the entire book. So uh, lots to cover. Let's get into it. As always, we're going to go ahead and do the uh, the kind of, you know, chapter summary slash reaction, if you will. And then uh, if any, you know, questions or spoilery stuff, I'll give you the heads up at the end and, and we'll do that stuff down at the back end. Okay, so things open up with Diker, who we got introduced to last time around. This time he's out traveling uh, the outskirts of Hisar. He's basically out to do some recon on the locals from the Seven Cities and just like kind of get a vibe for uh, what's going on like in the socio-political environment. I think Diker is Dal Han, and so he can kind of pass himself off as maybe one of the like natives of Dosan Pali and and kind of is able to creep into some of the local like merchant tents and stuff like that. They're covered in all the like symbols of the seven city, the seven cities. He uh is is kind of trying to do recon because again that's the the way that they're communicating is through all these kind of um, symbols and stuff that they do on the buildings to kind of communicate these broader marching orders or um, the undercurrents of the society and ultimately what he's trying to do is like figure out what the locals think about coltane right is it this big kind of uh, political powder keg that's about to explode on everyone? Is he hated? Is this gonna be, um, you know, a super fierce rebellion where they turn on him instantly? Or what is the deal? There's this like super weird reading between these two mages uh, or like warlock types shaman or whatever in the middle of the tent and they're like conjuring this spirit of Dirajna and that is basically this like spirit of the whirlwind and there's this like foretelling or a prediction that basically these two major forces are going to scrap it up in the holy desert. And so this is obviously like a reference to the coming scrap that's going down between the empire and the natives of the seven cities um, out in the kind of holy desert where Callum and Quick Ben and the bridge burners had originally scrapped it up so many years ago. He shows up finally at the Imperial compound and he attends this kind of like leadership meeting between Coltane, his number two bolt, um, Culp, the kind of uh, cadre mage, and then Malik Rell, who's the one who's basically got High Fist Pormqual, uh in his back pocket. And immediately, like, Malik Rell is totally thrown off because he didn't know Diker, the Imperial historian, was going to be there to uh, document the meeting. And, and Diker is, like, realizing that Coltane probably brought him there on purpose to, like, throw uh, Malik Rell off kilter. <laughs> But then he like pretty much immediately goes back on that and doesn't give Coltane the credit and just says, oh, it's probably like a happy accident. Coltane's not smart enough to be able to like engineer um, a moment like that. But he definitely does seem a little bit smarter than he's given credit for by Coltane or by Culp or, or anybody like that for sure and, and kind of is flying under the radar a little bit. The other thing he does, which is so funny, is he like takes away all the chairs. So everybody just has to stand up and nobody knows like to lean against the wall or uh, everybody's just like super uncomfortable and he kind of keeps them on that off kilter uh, footing. It's pretty funny. But he doesn't really tell him much, right? But actually Coltane's able to suss a lot out of him just by his like reluctance to share candid information. They remember back about how when Lacine originally conquered the Wiccans that she, um, you know, basically executed all of the Wiccan warlocks by hanging them off the walls. Bruh. Yeah. So, but Bolt and Coltane basically explain that, like, Lacine was an idiot because um, actually the way that their magic works, the crows came and essentially harvested 
all of the souls of these Wiccan warlocks and took them back to the tribe and basically transferred them into all these unborn kids so their spirits could be like reincarnated again. And that's basically when Sormo Enath comes in, and that is um, Coltane's uh, warlock, his Wiccan warlock. And he is essentially like the reincarnation of what used to be the number one most powerful Wiccan mage or warlock in, in the whole deal. And even though he looks like a, a kind of 10, 12-year-old kid, he is actually this kind of reincarnated G'd up thug. And he was actually the one that was spying on Diker out in the tents earlier in the chapter. And so he knows that uh, Diker was out there kind of like doing recon in the field. And basically they both go through and kind of recount the foretelling where they say there's going to be this big scrap between the Empire and the Seven Cities natives out in the desert. This totally like pisses Malik Rell off and he like flips out and totally dismisses that this is even a possibility, um, which is super suspect, obviously. Um, but then he, he kind of yells at him and almost storms out of the meeting. But Sormo Enath just totally calls him out for having his own like hidden self-serving agenda and basically tells them to shut up. <laughs> And then it's at this point where Coltane basically shows he's not just this savage, like, warrior idiot dude, but actually has, like, a really firm grasp of everything that's been going on and all those political undercurrents that Diker wasn't giving him the credit for being able to understand or engineer, definitely. And he said Culp is basically like a proxy for the way that the whole army feels about him. He's like, um, you know, scared of him. He thinks of him as like a viper in a nest. And he knows that's the whole uh, perception of him and that he doesn't really care. Right. Because he's not there to be buddies with them. He's there to get the army to fight for him and to ultimately put down this rebellion in the seven cities on behalf of the empire. He's like, basically, I don't give a f if they like me or not. They have two choices. They can either A follow my orders, or B, get their hearts ripped out of their chest. Damn! And then Malik Rell basically steps in and delivers what are, you know, supposedly Pormqual's orders to Coltane. And he basically tells him, like, look, the whole fleet, um, you know, Admiral Knox's fleet is taking the whole command structure back to uh, Aaron, and you're going to bring this whole army over land to, uh, to meet us there. But Coltane essentially recognizes this for what it is, that it's like a, a signal of weakness. It's showing the locals your belly in, uh, in terms of the rebellion, and it's going to be viewed as a retreat. And that's exactly how Coltane sees it, too. And so, uh, you know, Rel's like, oh, are you getting insubordinate or whatever? And he's like, no, I'm just counseling a change. He's like, so um, run off, basically, and deliver my message that I think we need to change the plan. And I'll wait here and see what happens. And then he goes on to like clown Malik Rell for like not even being part of the Imperial command structure and that nobody back in Unta even recognizes his power and essentially just like totally clowns him. Bolt also gets in a few shots across the bow and it was like so funny because he's like, you don't command Coltane, you don't command me, you don't even command a cook of the seventh army. So just go ahead and go and just straight up dismisses him. <laughs> Bye, Felicia. And then Diker essentially gets to report on everything that he knows about Malik Rell and uh, Pormqual, which is not that much, but he just says again that Pormqual is somehow in Malik Rell's back pocket. Nobody knows how or why, um, but it's it's kind of generally accepted that Malik Rell is the one calling the shots. Coltane kind of asks what happened to the old um, high fist of Aaron, basically, in the Seven Cities, and that was Cartheron Crust, and so we get a little bit of the, the backstory there with the old guard that basically kind of disappeared in the wake of uh, Lacine taking the throne. And you can tell Diker's still, like, super bitter about this, right? And his suspicion is that Lacine went through and culled the whole old guard. And this is kind of something that we're susceptible to believing because we saw her doing the cull of the nobility in Unta during the prologue. We'd seen what she did to the bridge burners. And it just kind of, you know, Diker seems like a good guy. And so, um, again, Lacine is starting out already with kind of like two strikes against her when when it comes to the reader's view <laughs> you're dead to me strangely enough though and this is a crazy part of the chapter but you know bolt 
actually offers like an alternative interpretation of the events. And he's essentially like defending Lacine, which is crazy to me, but he basically puts it out there like, what if everyone bailed on her in the wake of her taking a throne and she is just like lost and alone and facing all these challenges with rebellions and the war in Genabacus going south and, you know, seven cities going belly up and all this stuff with no one left that she can actually trust. And he also kind of offers an alternative history on this like beloved uh, emperor and dancer, right? And that maybe they were off like doing whatever their secret mission was and that they actually weren't the best rulers of the empire and like weren't good at the governing bit. Kind of like a different perspective than what we've we've heard up till this point where we, you know, feel pretty certain that we know who the villains are at this point in the story having read Gardens of the Moon. So ultimately what happens is that Coltane asks him to go off and ask Diker to be a spy on Malik Rell in Aaron and to leave with the fleet. Um, but instead, you know, Diker says, I'm not kind of into being a spy. And so Coltane just assigns him to his staff and charges him with kind of documenting um, the whole, you know, series of events that are about to go down. We also get some like killer backstory in this chapter. So we find out that Bolt... Uh, Coltane's number two was actually the one who almost killed Diker back in the day uh, when they were originally conquering the Wiccans. And so uh, Bolt charges Diker and he's about to kill him. And then he realizes like Diker is unarmed and and like turns the lance at the last minute, but still almost kills him. And that's why Bolt actually has a totally jacked up like scarred face that's been split down the middle with a sword is because Back in the day, uh, Dujek One Arm, when he was still Dujek Two Arms, uh, charges in to try and like avenge Diker essentially, and you know slices up Bolt's face. At the same time, Bolt's horse uh, takes off and creates the you know takes off Dujek's arm and creates the kind of Dujek One Arm that we all know and love from the last book. So uh, yeah, definitely got some deep history there. So, mystery solved on the old Dujek one-arm nickname. <laughs> After that meeting ends, we basically see Culp and Diker go off into a side room, and essentially Diker asks Culp to uh, help him rescue Hiborik out of the Odotaro mine. So apparently Hassar is not far, um, and obviously we know that Dosin Pali is right by the Odotaro mines as well, and, uh, and he needs somebody to help him with this kind of rescue mission. He also kind of does like a little bit of a post-mortem or like a debrief on on the stuff that uh, Bolt was saying in the meeting about, you know, Lessine. And he says, you know, basically, even if that is correct, like she made her own bed and now she has to lie on it. I don't feel any sympathy like what she did still wasn't right, even if all of uh, Bolt's points about kind of being sympathetic to her um, are true. He, he basically is still pretty bitter. <laughs> Culp also basically confirms that like, yeah, Sormo Enath really was this like crazy G'd up warlock and not just a 12 year old kid. And Culp like did this brilliant job of playing it off and like showing him basically no respect um, as if he really was a 12 year old kid because he didn't want him to know that he had this like um, power against him <laughs> or whatever. But uh, he really is like actually scared of him. <laughs> And then we finally jump back over to uh, to Erlatan, and that's where Fiddler and Callum and company are kind of slowly making their way overland to uh, to Quantali, and and they're going via Aaron, and so they're kind of all on this same uh, continent. They basically see the uh, the Red Blades come through and do this kind of like bloody crackdown, similar to the way that they were doing during the Prisoner March back in the prologue. They come out and almost cut Fiddler's head off, but he does this like little barrel roll to get out of the way. But then they end up just like killing the woman who was right behind him and she leaves two orphans behind. And then Fiddler feels all like guilty, like, oh, if I wouldn't have ducked, then maybe this chick would still be alive. And so he feels all bad. And when this like pimp basically comes and takes the two girls and is about to like put them to work on the streets, Fiddler follows him into this back alley and he basically goes in there and like punks the dude and takes the two girls to to rescue him. Aww. 
he delivers them home to their house and gets them to kind of point out where they live. He asks for like a couple bucks, essentially, but ends up getting invited to dinner as kind of a way to say thank you. And then it turns out these girls' grandpa is this kind of crazy Tano spirit walker um, named Kimlock. And Kimlock recognizes him right away as a Mesla, right? And he thinks he's like a Mesla spy there trying to find information about him. And Fiddler tells him actually he's just like on the run from the Empire and trying to make his way to uh, to Aaron. And basically, uh, Kimlock is very easily able to kind of, you know, suss out that he is actually um, one of these like famous bridge burners. And Kimlock is kind of this like wealth of information. He tells him that like the... Uh, uh, whirlwind of the apocalypse is coming out to the desert in Raraku. Raraku? Raruku? He says they're going to end up right in the mix of that. He tells them all about this convergence of Soul Taken and Deavers, which we heard about in the first chapter from Ikarium and Mappo, and also from the Denrabi that we saw him come across in the first chapter as well, and kind of explains that like they don't even really know what they're doing. They're just kind of like pulled to it like a moth to a flame, and that they're ultimately hoping to uh, you know battle it out for supremacy, and that the victor you know, basically gets to uh, ascend and become like the god of the soul taken or the Deavers. And then Kimlock basically tells him like, look, I kind of respect your mission that you're on to kind of set things right. And he also kind of explains, look, even though like the bridge burners and the empire were seen as invaders, they also like won our respect as, as well. And he kind of offers to actually sing the song of the bridge burners and then we get this whole internal monologue from fiddler talking all about how that's how the tano spirit walkers magic works and he he sings his songs and it kind of invests the object or the subject of those songs with his his magical uh, abilities and that that could even potentially mean like ascendancy for the bridge burners and and he says all i need is like your story and he basically tells him like look i don't have time to tell my whole entire story and he goes no that's cool if i just touch your skin i'll know your whole story and fiddler's like uh nah we're good and so instead kim Locke basically gives him this like conch shell like lord of the flies style <laughs> and that he has invested with a bunch of magical powers and and gives him that instead and then uh and then as Fiddler's getting up to leave, he like reaches out and touches his shoulder anyway. <laughs> Fiddler also learns at this time that like literally the last guest that Kim Locke accepted was uh, Dujek One Arm when he basically surrendered his city to Dujek. And they go through again kind of some of the backstory of the Empire where they were just really worried that the Empire was willing to like kill as many people as possible to get what they wanted. And for Kim Locke, he knew that he might be able to beat him, uh, but then they might send in the Talon Imas and just massacre everybody, and there was just going to be too much death. And ultimately, the, the Empire wasn't going to stop. And so he has like a terrible reputation now. But he really saw uh, the lay of the land and realized that this was really um, going to happen the easy way or the hard way. Then we see Callum actually go out and do his little bit out in the town. And he links up with one of his old informants. And he's kind of battling with this conflict because he's like a Malazan, obviously, and flipped over um, when when the conquest happened way back when. But he still feels like loyalties to the seven cities and there's a rebellion brewing. And so he's got this kind of um, con internal conflict happening. When he makes contact with his uh, his informant, essentially, he's trying to get information about all the different symbols so that he can understand, you know, what are the undercurrents running. And the guy tells him, basically, there is only one symbol. It's the symbol of the whirlwind of the apocalypse. He shakes him down and finds that he's actually like carrying this book, which ends up being the holy book of Dirajna. And that is like the, you know the special book that is going to set off this rebellion that he was going to deliver into the hands of Sheikh, and they were going to use it for their army to unleash the whirlwind um, and basically retake the, the seven cities. And this informant had basically jacked it out of the library of High Fist Pormqual. And that's like what the plan was, was to go deliver this book out into the desert. Um, Callum ends up taking it and, and basically using it as his ticket to get um, safe passage across the desert with all these like gnarly forces out there. 
Break yourself, fool! But then Callum bails and we find out that this guy Meta is actually like a double agent against Seven Cities. And so he had actually informed the Red Blades that he was, you know, going to gonna steal this book and they were going to use it to trace, um, you know, the, the informant or whoever was going to deliver it out to shake so that the red blades and everybody else could kind of take down the the rebellion and so now you've got all these red blades including lostara yill um ten baralta and he actually also tells ten baralta that uh, callum has to be going to take down lacine which flips everybody out and so um, just a whole bunch of stuff gets kicked off because there's all kinds of double crossing happening callum is taking the book of drajna out to shake but now he's got the red blades on his tail and after him too. Then lastly, we link back up with Mapo Runt and Ikarium. Ikarium has to uh, take down another um, Deavers. I think this time it was a Leopard, and that totally trips Mapo out again because it just seems like when this bloodlust happens to Ikarium, that's really scary for Mapo that it has like the potential to uh, unleash something really bad. We see him link up with this bear. Uh, Masrem, I think, is his name, and he refers to our uh, Ikarium as the maker of the mechanism. So there's just this whole uh, mystery brewing around Ikarium with his long life and history and the internal monologue that you get from Mapo um, about, you know, how long and how connected they are to, to past events. And so um, something definitely is up with them then they they link up with or they seek refuge in this uh, cave and that happens to be the home or the entryway to the home of one of my favorite characters um, Iskaral Puss the Magus of Shadow and he has like the classic first entrance where he like totally eats it off the mule um, they think he's all bloody but he just spilled red paint he's like talking out loud and thinking it's an internal dialogue that they can't hear and is just his uh lovable kooky um self condescending but also crazy self and so he's taken over this this temple that used to belong to the queen of dreams he's got this super weird servant this super weird uh mule that never are in the same place at the same time and he invites them to to basically come up and stay for a bit and he references like one life given for one life taken, which meant nothing to me the first time around. But now I'm realizing um, that, uh, yeah, it all makes so much more sense. So it all seems super crazy, but Mapo and Akarium both know there's like a ton of power present there. And so, yeah, the mystery is, uh, is really heating up. So uh, again, second chapter packed with all kinds of drama and information things are are getting really hot if you haven't read through the whole series jump out now because i want to get a couple of uh of comments and feedback from folks on on some of the juicy bits that happen that are foreshadowing so go on get All right, so yeah, this this chapter is interesting after having read the whole thing because uh, you know the stuff with uh, Lacine and trying to get this alternate interpretation again. She's kind of been painted as having all these strikes against her for betraying the bridge burners, for assassinating the previous emperor, and all the other shady stuff that she's um, alleged to have done. It's really interesting to see Bolt and Coltain kind of backing her up or providing this alternate history. And I feel like every time I read these books, I become like more sympathetic to um, Surly and, and really kind of um, realize how undervalued she is as a character because I think she really does have her like eye on the bigger prize and she just like has this problem of not being likable and not inspiring all this loyalty necessarily but actually being very capable and actually um having having her eye on the prize and being pretty good um you know she's willing to do some pretty heinous stuff but she does seem to have like the greater good in mind when it's all said and done at the end and so maybe she really was like this is like an inverted command structure 
in like we have in Gardens of the Moon, where she wasn't, you know, relegating, casting Coltane out when she took over because he was loyal to the emperor, but rather keeping him in reserve because she was going to need a leader exactly like that who could empathize with the people of Seven Cities um, for the coming rebellion, which was um, bound to happen. Maybe she needed the right people in the right place to combat the the kind of push by Malik Rell, which she could foresee that someone was going to try and like weasel their way into command via the chaos of the seven cities too. So um, maybe she wasn't such a total B, but she was actually, um, you know, really having a lot of foresight and playing that three dimensional chess and being able to see way ahead and people just mistook it for her being a total asshole. So yeah, let me know. I want to know your comments and what you guys think about Lacine up to this point and, and what you think of her in general. Because again, every time I read these books, I like like Surly more and more and more and just think she's so um, valuable and underrated and such a complex character and um, feel bad for her and also pissed at her and everything in between. So we'll go ahead and leave this video there for chapter two on Dead House Gates if you liked it. Give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. Join the Discord. Join the Facebook. Join the subreddit. Um, and uh, yeah, until next time, happy reading.